Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to continue in the book, Code Word Barbalon. 666, Danger in the Vatican, the Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination by P.D. Stewart. Get it at www.luxverbi.org, L-U-X-V-E-R-B-I dot O-R-G. And if you can, buy two copies. Keep one for yourself and uh, give one to someone who will benefit from it. And that could be just about anybody because this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order is not even known amongst most Americans and this is, uh, I've considered this, uh, this book a one-stop shopping. If you want one book to cite, uh, one book, a circumspective book that explains the entire Jesuit order and its history, this is the book to get. Get it again from luxverbi.org. Now, we were talking Wednesday about the suppression of the Jesuits by Pope Clement XIV in the year 1773. We're going to continue that discussion today, uh, backing up a paragraph for continuity purpose. The sun- subtitle of this portion of the chapter is entitled, Jesuits Suppressed, Danger in the Vatican. P.D. Stewart writes, he says, We come now to the reasons for the famous suppression, the expulsion from most of Europe, of the order called the Society of Jesus in 1773. Louis XV was then on the throne. The Jesuits had earlier been dealt a serious blow by Blaise Pascal, a French Huguenot and Calvinist. Pascal had written a series of best-selling and controversial pamphlets called the, the, uh, the Provincial Letters. They were published in 1656 and 1657 as cited uh, previously, which were devastating in their exposure of the Jesuits. Now, the provincial letters are still available. You can buy them on uh, eBay. I recommend you get a copy and read those letters by Blaise Pascal about the Jesuits. Very damaging to the Jesuit order, and it came at a most opportune time. And it says, try as they might, their attempts to defend themselves, that is, the Jesuits, against this Frenchman's letters, and to have his publications banned were entirely unsuccessful. Pascal not only made the Jesuits odious, he made them look ridiculous. Quote, these Jesuit casuists, wrote Pascal, give us elbow room in all events. In other words, their their iniquity was monumental. Okay? And it says, Pascal's expose have brought the intrigues of the Jesuits to the fore once again. A commission was appointed by the French authorities to examine the constitutions and the privileges of the Jesuits. The commission reported that the Society of Jesus was dangerous to the state, hostile to the Gallican liberties, and unlawful. Now, I think I tried to explain a little bit Wednesday that the Gallicans were Christians, or were, excuse me, Catholics, but they held the papacy as merely a spiritual leader. And they hated the temporal power of the papacy. They hated the influence that the papacy had on their government, and they hated the influence that the Jesuits had on their government. The Jesuits and the pap- uh, the papacy through the Jesuits tried to upset the peace in France, and to instigate violence between Catholics and Protestants who were living in peace in France at that time, relative peace. The Gallicans were tired of war. They were tired of religious persecution. And they asked the Pope, please, be our spiritual head, but leave our government alone. And uh, it says further in, in the book, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, the writings of their most reverend professors, St. Bellarmine and Professor Bossenbaum, were ordered to be burnt. So there was violence 
in, in France against the Jesuit order and their Jesuit professors, St. Bellarmine. We've talked about him before when we read the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. Now, the French authorities then moved to suppress the Jesuits completely. The decree for the suppression of the society was passed by Parliament in 1762, but its execution was delayed by orders of the king. Now, the Jesuits had great influence with the French king. Parliament, on the other hand, was sick and tired of the meddlings of the Jesuits and the, and the papacy and the government. So the Jesuits had successfully divided the, the head of state, the French king, and Parliament, were, were at loggerheads over the Jesuits. And it appears now that Parliament's finally going to win out. Here's a quote from the Jesuit general Lorenzo Ricci <clears throat> regarding the Jesuits at the time of their suppression. He says, let them be as they are or else not be. And that's what, uh, that's how replied Jesuit General Lorenzo Ricci when he responded to Louis XV's demand for their reform. So Louis XV tried to buy some time, tried to keep the Jesuits around and suggested they reform. And in order to stave off this, this widespread public sentiment against the Jesuits, Lorenzo Ricci said, let them be as they are or else not be. And the French king had no choice but to drive them out of his realm. In 1763, all the Jesuit colleges were closed. Pay particular attention how this process takes place, this process of kicking them out of the country. This is something the United States needs to do if the American people would ever just learn to recognize the source of all the ills in this country. We suffer the same ills as every nation in history that ever allowed the Jesuits onto their shores. And it should be no mystery to any American where our problems originate. And this is how France remedied the problem. Now, granted, it wasn't a, perp a, a, a permanent eradication of the Jesuits. We can learn from their mistakes. It says, the French king had no choice but to drive them out of his realm. In 1763, all Jesuit colleges were closed. The members of the society were required to renounce their vows under treatment, uh, excuse me, under threat of banishment. But as hardly any members of the society complied with this condition, the decree, the decree of banishment was promulgated in 1763, or 1764. <clears throat> now look, the Jesuits didn't cooperate then, they're certainly not going to cooperate now. If uh, any attempt is made by the United States to remedy this problem, they're going to have to take more permanent means to eliminate the Jesuits from this country. It says already a similar fate had befallen them, that is their ousting in Portugal in 1759, and was soon followed in Spain in 1767. It says the Spanish decree was very broad. It suppressed them in the Philippines, Argentina, New Granada, Peru, Chile, Ecuador, Guatemala, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico, New Mexico, and Arizona. Austria followed suit in 1773. Blow after blow fell upon them with crushing force, and at length they were banished with merciless severity and transported to the coasts of the Roman states. That the Society of Jesus has been expelled from so many different countries. Listen to what P.D. Stewart says. That the Society of Jesus has been expelled from so many different countries at so many different periods suggests that the Society of Jesus conceals something very dis disturbing if not iniquitous within it. A whole order was not expelled from France, Spain, Portugal, England, etc., merely because the Society of Jesus contained a few bad apples. No, a gross evil must reside within that society called the Jesuits. And a copious understanding of Jesuit history leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Neither does this book. 
leaves no room for doubt. There resides within Jesuitism an evil that cannot be underestimated. Now, before the French suppression, Pope Clement XIV first made every effort to get the Jesuits to agree to a reform of their constitutions and regulations, but without avail. In the end, Clement XIV, against his wishes and under much pressure from France, Spain, all Catholic countries, France, Spain, and Portugal, was forced to abolish the order entirely. This he did with a most comprehensive papal decree, and the author calls it a brief. Uh, so, uh, others call it a bull. It was dated July 21st, 1773, which he signed on July 23rd. The aforementioned bull, Dominic Act Redemptor Noster, decreeing the suppression of the society, in which he summed up a masterly fashion the causes and the motives that had guided him into making the fatal decision. Okay, in the bull, he enumerates all the various charges brought against the Jesuit order. It says the bull recited with good justification a long and heinous catalog, a catalog of charges against the Jesuits. Amongst other things, it charged them with instigating various insurrections and rebellions, plottings, undermining corporations of every sort in Europe, in Asia, and in America, and labeled them, quote-unquote, bane of all nations. The bane of all nations. Do you think America should be an exception to that? And yet, not a not not one word of protest has ever been raised against the Jesuits in this country. Not until recently. It's further accused them of tumults, disturbances, violence, and disturbing of the peace, the peace of the church and of the nations. The Pope, in enumerating their faults, said that these faults were so great as to outweigh their services. Okay? They completely destroyed their benefit. Whatever benefit that the Jesuits provided were far outweighed by their crimes. In consequence, the Jesuits were utterly dispossessed of every office, service, and administration, and also had their houses, schools, hospitals, estates confiscated. The bull withdrew all their statutes, usages, decrees, customs, and ordinances, and pronounced, quote, all the power of the general, provincial, visitors, and every other head of the same order, whether spiritual or secular, to be forever annulled and suppressed. And no matter in what province, state, or kingdom they might be found. The bull concluded with these memorable words, quote, For the sake of peace, and because the society can no longer attain the aims for which it was founded, and on the secret grounds which we enclose in our heart, we suppress the said society. The present ordinance shall remain in full force and operation from henceforth and forever, nor shall, it, nor shall its meanings ever be rescinded, glossed, or explained away. It ended, quote, in the interest of peace and religion, unquote. The fall of the Society of Jesus could hardly have been more sensational. The Jesuits were unceremoniously suppressed, or so it seemed. He continues, he says, The secret grounds alluded to by Pope Clement XIV are still to be disclosed. But perhaps there is a hint from the Pope when he said, quote, Sometimes we must cut down a mast to save the ship. And further, he said, for the sake of peace, unquote. So here we have the first indication that this suppression from the very beginning was meant to be only temporary. You have to cut down the mast of the ship, uh, the mast just to save the ship. Now, it says, and no doubt the general Lorenzo Ricci knew that in some circumstances to retreat is better than defeat. 
Could it be that Pope Clement XIV and General Ritchie realized that the tide of opinion in Europe was against them, and so to save the ship, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, the general was made to sacrifice some of his best soldiers, and even his pope, for the greater glory of God, of course. That being the motto, one of the mottos of the Jesuit order. All for the greater glory of God. And once the ship, the Roman Catholic Church, had arrived safely to harbor and the storm had blown over, the mast was rebuilt and the ship was sent ahoy. As the Catholic Encyclopedia admits, Pope Clement XIV, Ganganelli was his name, showed an, quote, appearance of a hostile attitude toward the Jesuits. Intrigue upon intrigue. They did rise again, and they're all powerful in the United States of America. They've literally harnessed the power of this country to wage war, proxy wars, to better their aim in the world of raising the papacy to world supremacy. And their, mo their main goal in that process is to destroy Protestantism. They write the laws that are passed in this country that take away our Protestant liberties. The Jesuit priests are all powerful in Washington, D.C. To cover up, they're called the, the, the Christian right or, or, or the, the, the Christian lobby. Jesuitism is behind it. Jesuitism is even behind the opposition. And that's how they manage piecemeal to tear down this Protestant nation and it's time for the hue and cry for their suppression in this country to come forth from the people. He says, nevertheless, under the terms of, the, of Clement's suppression, the Jesuit general Lorenzo Ricci was made a prisoner, as demanded by the Bourbon kings and their other European allies. It was they who forced Clement XIV to agree to the suppression of the Jesuits. But these rulers soon had cause to regret their daring to meddle with the Society of Jesus. Even the Jesuit uh, propagandist, Reverend James McCaffrey, S.J., all but admits that it was the Jesuits who fomented the volatile and unruly elements which later erupted into the revolutions that swept away the monarchies of France and those nations that had called for their suppression. In other words... Retaliation soon followed. It was called the Napoleonic Wars, the French Revolution. And their purpose was to punish all the kings of Europe that demanded for the, su the suppression of the Jesuit order. See what consequence may lie if anyone takes serious action to do anything about the Jesuit order. That's why this entire world needs to be educated about this bane of all nations. He says, The revolution was in full swing. The thrones of France, Spain, Portugal, and Naples were overturned, and those members of the royal families who escaped the scaffold or the dungeon were themselves driven to seek refuge in foreign lands, just as the Jesuits had been driven in the days of Clement XIV and his suppression. Pope Clement XIV, as we shall see, did not fare much better. Not long after Clement fell, not long after Clement fell fatally ill. Pope Clement, though Clement XIV, the one who wrote the bull of suppression, fell fatally ill immediately afterwards. It says the record states that at the time of this bull or brief, however you'd see it, the Pope was in the most robust health, quote, and his rigorous constitution and temperate habits promised a long life. In other words, there was no sign that this Pope wouldn't reign for a good long time. But no sooner had he signed the decree against the Jesuits did rumors begin to be whispered in Italy that the Pontiff would soon die, to be ushered into the realm of the saints by a precisely measured dose of something akin to hemlock. The rumors and fears soon proved true. Not long after it was alleged, he was served with the dreaded aketa, 
which poison does not at once prove fatal, but according to the administered dose, in other words, the size of the dose given, it may be crudely predicted how long it will take before the victim dies. In other words, you can prolong the victim's suffering by regulating the size of the dose, but fatality is assured no matter what size of dose. Now, in April the following year, the Pope began to decline in health without any apparent cause. His illness increased. No medicine was of any avail. Clement, who up to then had enjoyed the most robust health, showed symptoms of a strange and unknown disease that completely baffled the court physicians. Up to this time, even the Jesuit uh, uh, Georgel tells us that the Pope's, quote, strong constitution seemed to promise a long career, unquote. Valerie Peary gives more details, quote, He gradually lost his voice while his tongue and throat became so inflamed that he was driven to keep his mouth perpetually agape in an attempt to obtain through the freshness of the air some relief from his sufferings. The pontiff, who had been strong and untiring, became as weak as an infant. His limbs betrayed him, and he could scarcely drag himself from the chair to the couch. Alternately, he would be a prey to, uh, to insomnia or fall into a stupor from which he could not be roused. The Pope realized his doomed condition, cried out on his deathbed, quote, Alas, I knew they would poison me, but I did not expect to die in so slow and cruel a manner, unquote. The Pope suffered in his illness. He lingered. His agony lasted months. Quote, several days before his death, writes Galezo Caraccioli and others, quote, his bones were exfoliated and withered like a tree which, attacked at its roots, withers away and throws off its bark, unquote. In the end, Pope Clement XIV would survive his attempted destruction of the Jesuits by just 14 months. After lingering in agony for several months, he died on September 27, 1774. One source gives the date, September 28th. Nonetheless, quote, the scientific men who were called to embalm his body found his features livid, his lips black, the abdomen inflated, the limbs emaciated and covered with violet spots. The size of the head was diminished, and all the muscles were shrunk up, and the spine was decomposed. They filled the body with perfumed and aromatic substances, but nothing could dispel the morphitic effluvia, unquote. Rumors abounded that Clement XIV had been poisoned by the Jesuits. Quote, It will be lawful for an ecclesiastic or one of religious order, that is the Jesuits, to kill a calumniator who threatens to spread atrocious accusations against himself or his religion, is the rule given by the Jesuit Francis Amicus. The Jesuits have been given permission to kill, by whatever means, someone who would calumniate or unsettle the Jesuit order, and they've exercised that privilege throughout their history. They've exercised it many times in this country against our own presidents. And it's high time the American people knew the truth. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. 
If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crosstheborder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Now I want to return to the book and this quote that we read just before the break. It says, quote, it'll be lawful for an ecclesiastic or one of the religious orders, that is Jesuits in this particular case, to kill a calumniator who threatens to spread atrocious accusations against himself or his religion. This is the rule given by the Francis, uh, the Jesuit Francis Amicus. And Pope Clement the Fourteenth was, in their eyes, such a calumniator. Indeed, as we have read, the Jesuit oath states, quote, in part, this is just a partial quote of the Jesuit oath, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poignard, that is the dagger, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons. And that's the end of the, the, uh, the brief quote, the abbreviated quote in the Jesuit oath. I hope that you will take the time this weekend to Google the extreme oath of the Jesuits and read it for yourself. Study it. Because we'll refer to it often in the reading of this book. Understand what the aim of the Jesuit order is simply by reading their oath. And also remember that a virtually identical oath is taken by every Knight of Columbus in this country. 
it's it's no conspiracy theory. It's a fact. Now he says that would include Pope aside, wouldn't it? The part of the quote says, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority, that indeed does include Pope aside. And the Jesuits have killed many of their own popes. That establishes for us the truth that despite his apparent submissiveness to the white pope, the black pope rules this world, and the white pope has an area in which he may operate, but if he steps out of that area, he's toast. The Jesuits are going to rule this world come hook or crook, come hell or high water. And if anybody stands in their way, they have the use of the world's nuclear forces. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt one whit that they wouldn't use whatever power at their means. It says several historians have opined that the poison that was given to Pope Clement the 14th was administered by, was administered by one of his regular guests or a servant. And it is a fact that every week the Pope met with his Jesuit confessor. Now, something else to be considered. This Pope, Clement the Fourteenth, knew. He just knew that by suppressing the Jesuits, he was signing his own death warrant. So one has to know that he took extra precautions to protect himself against what he knew would certainly come an attempt on his life, and they got him anyway. It says, even to this day, of those who have access to the Pope, the Jesuits are always the best positioned. The Jesuits know all the secrets of the Pope and have the most intimate access to the Roman pontiffs. Indeed, some of the Pope's closest advisors are Jesuits. Further, it is a requirement that the Pope's confessor must be a Jesuit. Jean, uh, John McCocher's work, entitled Jesuits, a multi-biography, confirms that Pope Paul VI, that is Cardinal Monti- Montini, had as his confessor a Jesuit priest. And the Jesuit Cardinal pa- uh, Paolo Diza, uh, with whom the Pope is said to have had almost daily meetings, tells us that the white Pope has private monthly face-to-face meetings with the black Pope. And it says, nor were these weekly meetings a peculiarity in Pope uh, Paul VI's papacy. The Pope's confessor, an ordinary priest, must be a Jesuit. He must visit the Vatican once a week at a fixed time, and he alone may absolve the Pope of his sins. Unquote. In fact, Cardinal Diza was confessor of two popes, Pope Paul VI and Pope Paul I both of whom chose him as a confessor. I think I misspoke. That was Pope Paul VI and Pope John Paul I. Okay, I think I said Pope Paul I. The reader may be surprised to learn that there have been several such papal assassinations and attempts at assassinations. Malachi Martin, the former Jesuit professor and Vatican insider, says that the tensions between Pope Paul VI and the Jesuit order was so high that the pontiff was thinking about dissolving the company a second time. He was not to live to execute such the, such plans. In 1970, Pope Paul VI was almost stabbed to death by Benjamin Mondiza Amor Flores. Malachi Martin writes, quote, Had it not been for that stiff collar and the speed of Paul's private secretary, Monsignor Maki, who caught Mandiza's arm and slowed the force, Pope Paul VI would have been killed. As it was, he was wounded slightly on both sides of the neck, unquote. Then on July 14, 1978, for no apparent reason, Pope Paul VI fell to unconsciousness for four hours and died soon after of a massive heart attack. 
it would be remiss of me not to point out that almost every pope who has sought to dissolve the Jesuits has had an untimely and sudden demise. Likewise, Pope Paul VI's successor, Pope John Paul I, inherited a financial scandal involving the Jesuits, the Vatican Bank, and its American director, Bishop Paul Marchinkus. John Paul I decided to act. He went to bed with a copy of his speech about his plans to either terminate or reorganize the Jesuits. He was found dead by his bookkeeper the following morning. In an earlier age, so untimely a death might have stirred up deep suspicions. Time magazine on October 9, 1978 notes, quote, If this were the time of the Borgias, said a young teacher in Rome, there'd be talk of John that John Paul was poisoned, unquote. Three years later, on May 13, 1981, the successor of Pope John Paul I, Pope John Paul II, was struck by two bullets from a semi-automatic pistol of hitman Hemet Aliaka. Three weeks prior to the assassination attempt, Pope John Paul II had a meeting with six of the most powerful cardinals in the Vatican and was in deadlock talks with the Jesuit general. The topic? The forced resignation of the Jesuit general Pedro Arupe. John Paul had written a letter to Father General Arupe insisting on appointing an 80-year-old Jesuit cardinal Paolo Diza as his personal delegate to the Jesuits with power to govern the Society of Jesus. After the failed attempt on his life, Pope John Paul II withdrew his demands and lived a long life, unlike Pope Clement XIV. Not long thereafter, the attempted assassination of Pope John Paul II by uh, uh, Mahmet Ali, May 1981, the Jesuit general Pedro Urupe made his marvelous admission, quote, the company is feared everywhere. The people say, quote, these Jesuits are wily and so powerful, unquote. They shake it in our face. They don't fear anybody. But I know one they're going to fear. I know one that they're going to fear. And every one of them is going to bow their knee. Returning to the suppression for all its comprehensive and bold declarations, Pope Clement's decree of 1773 proved only partially successful and papally short-lived. Excuse me, palpably short-lived. After Clement's suppression and untimely death, Cardinal Braschi was elected Pope Pius VI on February 15, 1775. The success for, uh, excuse me, the successor to the unfortunate Clement XIV was no less in fear of the Jesuits. A former pupil of the Society of Jesus, he knew their wrath. Almost immediately he sought to secure the release of Father Ricci, uh, Ricci the Jesuit general, and his assistants from prison in Castle St. Angelo. But Charles III, King of Spain, insisted on their detention. Moreover, the Jesuits were never suppressed in Russia or Germany. Those are the exceptions, Russia and Germany. Where do you suppose the Jesuits fled? Russia and Germany. Pope Pius VI, seeing the fate of his predecessors, concluded with Frederick II of Prussia, to saving the Jesuits. On March 2, 1783, Pope Pius VI approved the maintenance of the Jesuits in Russia. The other monarch to defy the suppression bull of Pope Clement XIV was Catherine II, Queen of White Russia from 1762 to 1796, who offered the same protection to the Jesuits with equal words of contempt for the Pope's bull. In 1777, the Empress Catherine approved the establishment of a Jesuit novitiate in Poland. Now, under the subtitle, The Suppression Fails, General Reasserts, uh, uh, Reasserts Power, it says, In the end, the suppression 
with which Pope Clement XIV sought to smite the Jesuits, lasted only 41 years, from 1773 to 1814. In 1800, Pope Pius VI was succeeded by Cardinal uh, Chiaramonti, who took the name of Pius XII. His papacy was by this time in name only, Napoleon having already annexed all that remained of the papal states in 1809, including the city of Rome, and announcing that the Pope no longer had any form of temporal authority. But this was another internal Catholic feud. On March 7, 1801, by decree, Catholic Fiade, Pope Pius XII reestablished the Jesuits on Russian soil, from where they were to regroup to launch a counteroffensive on their Protestant enemies in France, the French Revolution. Excuse me, I've been saying Pope Pius XII. This is Pope Pius VII. My apologies. Completely reversing the misfortunes of the Jesuits at the hand of Clement XIV, Pius VII, and by another bull, Solicitude Omnium Ecclesium, engineered the Grand Jesuit Return. On August 7, 1814, the Pope left the Quirinal Palace with much pomp for the short procession to number 45, Piazza del Gesù, uh, Gesù, the seat of the Jesuit general in Rome. There he read the bull, which after 41 years restored the Society of Jesus to all its former rights and privileges. And in the book, there's a, uh, there's a, a photograph of the facade of this Jesuit church in Rome near the Vatican. Where this, where this bull of restoration took place. In yet another twist to this story, we're told that on the occasion just mentioned, Pius VII, frightened out of his wits, gave the following apology for the bull of Clement XIV by delivering the most servile piece of flattery to the Jesuit general in his place, the Jesu. Quote, We would believe ourselves guilty before God of great error in that we neglected to help uh, the help granted us by God's special providence. We therefore decree to take into our trusteeship our immediate obedience all the members of this order, speaking of the Jesuits, unquote. Thus did the infallible Pope go bowing to the Jesuit general with such marks of respect and honor, expressing his gratitude in so servile and insipid a manner toward these ruthless persecutors and confessed assassins. This prompted Helena Petrovna Blavatsky to write mockingly, quote, The infallible Pope Clement XIV, as vicar of God, suppressed the Jesuits July 23, 1773, with his brief Dominic Act Redemptor, and yet they came to life again when another equally infallible Pope, Pius VII, reestablished them in August 7, 1814. Unquote. And so it was that Pius VII reopened at high tide the sluice gates from which the Jesuit, from which the French, Spanish, and Portuguese rulers tried to close shut. The Jesuit Brotherhood was back openly and once more stalked abroad in their black berettas. The Pope was to henceforth be an inert tool in their hands, a poor, weak instrument at the command of the Jesuit general. As the suppression goes, what a thing, that the order, which had sworn undying and unswerving obedience to the Pope, should now make all the Popes their footstool. Quote, in the enslavement of the Popedom, unquote. For as Alexander Robertson wrote, quote, the Jesuit, uh, excuse me, the general of the Jesuits, the black Pope, is the real and only Pope. The one who bears the title is but a figurehead. It is the Jesuits' policy to, uh, that he peruses, their voice that speaks through him, their hand that guides him. In other words, the white Pope is merely just a puppet of the black Pope. And it says, when illustrating this fact to me, Count Campello, who was a great friend of the late Pope Pio, uh, Pio Nino, which is Pope Pius IX, 
drew a circle, and he said, quote, Within that circle, the Pope is free. If he crosses it, he's a dead man, unquote. That's the power of the Jesuit order. They kill their own popes. There's no doubt about it. It's not rumor. It's not conspiracy theory. It's documented fact by numerous respected authors, many of them Catholics themselves. Does it make the Scripture even more powerful when it says, all the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. They have control of the kings of the earth. When they can kill pope after pope after pope and get by with it, what, what life insurance does any president or king or potentate on this earth have against the dagger, the poison cup, the strangulation cord or the leaden bullet. None. And as they proved in this country, they can kill the president of the most powerful country in the world in broad daylight with cameras rolling with people all around and nobody goes to jail. That's the message that the Jesuits have sent repeatedly to demonstrate they're untouchable. They can do whatever they want. And the governments of the world will help cover up their crimes. They killed President John F. Kennedy. He says, um, under the subtitle, The Jesuits Fully Restored and All-Powerful, he writes, However, the restoration of the Jesuits was not yet complete. The successor of Pope Pius VII, Cardinal Della G uh, Genga, who was Pope Leo XII, declared, quote, on, uh, uh, declared on January 6, 1829, that the Society of Jesus would be canonically restored in England. Thus, Leo XII reinstated the Jesuits to the highest pinnacle of their treacherous and fearful glory. The last stronghold in Europe was now once again their home. The 19th century, without a doubt, ended on a high for the Society of Jesus. As always, in the end, the Jesuits carry the day. As Professor Sarp equipped, even when a Jesuit plays the losing game, he always rises the, from the table a winner, unquote. That, that century saw the dry bones come together, and the great secret society rose from the dead like the phoenix to take its seat at the right hand of his holiness in the kingdom of the Pope on earth, the universal Catholic Church. Blavatsky commented of this resurrection, quote, The order of the Jesuits is now all-powerful in Rome. They have been reinstated in the Congregation of Extraordinary Ecclesiastical Affairs, in the Department of the Secretary of State, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The pontifical government was for years pre uh, previous to Ema uh, Victor Emmanuel's occupation of Rome entirely in their hands, unquote. The Jesuits restored again to all their ancient power and wealth, honor and dignity to form the tightest of union with the Pope as his most efficient and trusted lieutenants. With Thaddeus Borzadowski at the helm as their new general, they were henceforth, uh, they would henceforth employ even greater subtlety to promulgate their sophistries and to spread abroad their poisonous maxims. And so it was that, notwithstanding the Pope's decree declaring the Society of Jesus to be forever annulled and suppressed, and what appeared to be a fatal blow, the Jesuits revived again, more deadly than before, like a virus, you cannot get rid of it. Or as Edmund Burke said of them, quote, an infectious plague requiring the precautions of the most severe quarantine. Yes, I say quarantine. 
But, of course, the Jesuits would not admit to any of these facts, for the role of the Jesuit scholar is to blur the historical record with the intent of dumbing down or erasing from our conscious memory the atrocities of the papacy and their diabolical order. And so they have doggedly sought to rewrite historical facts in a manner that gives a more handsome and innocuous face to the fascist, barbarous, and ultramontane actions of the papacy and their order. This is the raison d'etre of the Jesuit historian, that is all they can stand for. That is a, that is main, their, uh, is, is their main reason for being, and perhaps nothing more. I remind you again of that desperate letter from the Privy Council of Great Britain, written to the superior Lord Falkland and Lord Deputy of Ireland. They lamented, quote, the Jesuits be not only a subtle society, but also an audacious sort of people, fearing no punishment, no, not even the halter itself, so that we are at a nonplus how to banish or to devise a means to chase away these wasps from their majesty's domain, unquote. Reader, this is no bigotry, doggerel, or childishness. Indeed, it was the third Jesuit general, Francisco Borgia, who once said of his men, quote, We came in like lambs and will rule like wolves. We shall be expelled like dogs and return like eagles. Dr. Giustinini, uh, an ex-priest who lived in Rome, hardly overstated the case against the Jesuits when he said, quote, If we consult history and experience, we find that another so infamous a class of men never lived. This, I assure my reader, is no exaggeration on his part. History shows that if you offer a Jesuit a ride, sooner or later he will throw you out of your own wagon. And that's what they're doing to us. They're throwing us out of our own wagon. Read the Jesuit oath this weekend. Read the extreme oath of the Jesuits. Read it twice. They're going to throw God's people out of their own wagon because that's what they've done ever since they were created. Tell your friends, wake up America. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross the Border. Sound biblical teaching for God's people. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org 
to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.